being an Alabama boy, you know, I saw the the commercial that they used to run for the WCW power play. And, you know, I said, you know what, man, I keep myself in decent shape. I wrestled in high school and was a state champion. I played football in high school, was a good athlete. You know, we won a state championship. And I don't think I'm good enough to be on that level. But, man, I just want to try out. And, and I want this experience. And maybe I get to meet Sting and shake his hand or, or Ric Flair mm-hmm. or somebody like that. You know, I just thought it would be a great experience. I was like 18 years old, man. So I called up the number because all you had to be was at least 18, at least 5'9", at least 189 pounds, and uh, and have a doctor's physical. And it was like $300 for the tryout or something. So I drove over to Atlanta. It was about a two-hour drive there, two-hour drive back home. It was a three-day tryout. And, dude, everything that you read about the tryouts were exactly that. You know, the power plant was every bit as brutal as you think it is. And it was like boot camp in the military or like Bud's training for a SEAL. You know, and I don't mm-hmm. know if you ever met Sarge or not, Mike. Did you ever get a chance to meet Sarge? It's funny you mentioned him, Lash. I uh, was supposed to have him on the show last night, and he, uh, he no-showed. Well, he does that. <laughs> he does that, man. He is a K favorite, man. He'll just hide out. And he gets in his shell a little bit sometimes, I think, is what it is. He, he means well by it. But he has trouble with the technology and stuff like that. But man, I hate that. But what a great guy he is. He's got a good heart. And uh, but man, he was rough around the age, the edges, and he was a legit, or at least I always heard he was a legit drill sergeant when he was in the Coast Guard. So he would come in, man, five, six, 230 pounds, built like a Rubik's Cube. He would just come in, throw his bag down and say, Everybody grab a bucket. And there were these five-gallon buckets in the corner, and you put them down, you do squats. You do the Hindu squats gimmicks, man, and you do 50. And then he'd make you run in place, drop down, 25 push-ups, spin over, 25 crunches, run in place again, and now it's 100. And he would just keep doing the squats, man, and all those gimmicks, one right after the other, hours on end. And, oh, wow. dude, there would be 24 guys that would come to a tryout class. That's what was in my tryout class. And it's sort of this mix of – Guys that were good college athletes, but not quite in, good enough to go pro are bodybuilders that had the body and had the look. And they thought, okay, they're going to see me and just sign me are guys that just had what I call that, that pump biker look where, where they're naturally six, six, which you can't trade 290 pounds, got tattoos all over them, a Mohawk and think I look like enough of a misfit that they're going to, they're going to see something in me. Well, those guys, man, would just fall out they weren't prepared for that level of training in our calisthenics anyway. And usually it was just things you couldn't help. Like your legs locked up from cramps and you just passed out or you fell out and Sarge would get in their face and say, man, you called us. We didn't call you. You can't do it. Go home. And they go home? Once I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he just, that was it. They walk out the door and uh, people would drop like flies in those tryouts. And when I realized this was a gut check, and they really took pride in who really wanted it. I looked around, man, and it suddenly dawned on me. I go, I've got the advantage because I've been through some stuff in my life by then, you know. So you might run me off, but I'm not going to quit. So if you're waiting on me to say no, Moss, it ain't happening. Right. So uh, right. by that, once that dawned on me and that light bulb clicked off, I, man, I can go for days because I just got no quit in me. And I started doing those squats, and I would do them, and I'd just Ric Flair woo with every one of woo, woo. You know, and just trying to show that I wanted to be there and show a good attitude. At the end of the first day, there was uh, 16 guys left out of 24. The next day, eight guys showed up. End of the day, there's maybe six left or something. You know, and the next day on that Friday, me and one other guy showed up. And uh, then you work a half a day doing that exact same. So it's 10 hours. The entire day is nothing but what I just described. And then the final day, you did about two hours of all that same deal again. Then he got you in the ring finally, taught you how to take basic bumps, taught you how to run the ropes just to see if you're athletic enough to do it. And that was it. They kayfabe the business. They kayfabe everything. And I still don't know what happened to the other dude because then they just bring you into the office. Jody Hamilton, the original assassin, would sit there. Sure. If you know Jody. Sure. It looks like the Winston Churchill of professional wrestling. <laughs> you know, he just sit back and, he go, look, we don't promise that you'll ever have a job. We're not telling you you'll ever be on TV. We're not saying here's a contract waiting on you. The only thing that we're promising you, Mike, is you know what? You 
showed us enough that we think that we could train you to be a wrestler. You're trainable. And if you want to pay us three grand, we'll train you. So you're not that's, trying out for – so the tryout isn't for a job. It's just to train at the power plant. That's right. It's a door. It's okay. a foot in the door. Right. And my mentality at the time was this. I go, you know what? You, you pay for any training in this world. You pay for trade school. You pay for JUCO. You know, you pay for college. You know, and and if I really legitimately don't think that this is just a fun, fun, ha-ha moment in my life, but really think I could parlay this into a career, why wouldn't I pay for the training when this was, at the time, the biggest wrestling company in the world? I mean, right. you know, you could argue whether or not they're actually bigger than WWE, but obviously they were more successful at that time. And, right. you know, so WCW's power plant was sort of the harbor of professional wrestling, and I thought, my mentality in life has always been, I'm going to shoot for the stars. And if I fall a little short and I don't make it in the WCW, I'm going to certainly be further ahead than these guys that are doing the indies. Sure. And, man, I had never been to a show before then. I'd never been backstage at a show. I'd never been in the wrestling ring until I went to the WCW power plant. Wow. But I had a good aptitude for the business, and it came natural to me because I was such a big fan growing up, man. Who else was down there? Oh, so at the time there, man, you've got guys, you've got a, a few different classes of wrestlers, for lack of a better way of saying it, that may be in there at any given time. you got guys that have gone through the training, but WCW really hasn't shown a whole lot of interest in them. And they've been good students, and they've paid their dues, so nobody's kicking them to the curb, but they're hanging around hoping a spot opens up somewhere, and they're yeah. finished with their training. Then you've got the grunts. you got the trainees that are there just to learn the business for the first time, and then you got guys that are – under contract with WCW, WCW sees something in them, but they're not quite polished. Uh, I would put somebody in that category, someone like a Goldberg, you know, that, oh, there's no question we're going to sign this guy, but he's right. not ready for prime time yet, you know. And then you got guys that are the real grinders. And what I mean by grinders is guys that love the craft, love the business, and they're constantly trying to better themselves. So they're down there on a pretty consistent basis if they're not on the road. And those would have been guys like Chris Canyon, Disco Inferno, Johnny Swinger, uh, you know, Brian, uh, Brian Clark. Uh, DDP was there all the time, you know, always trying to get better and always trying new moves. You know, in fact, DDP is the guy that I've got to thank for my old Bourbon Street Blues gimmick where I would jab the guy about three times, dance like James Brown, do the splits, pop Split. up. And yeah. Bump. Yeah. And I and that was all because the only thing I was trying to do is one day we were down there training. Paige was there in the ring. And I was taking advantage of being able to be in the ring with him. And I was trying to pop him. That's all I was trying to do was pop him. And I said, hey, Dally, this is what I'm going to start doing in my matches, man. I said, you know, The Rock's got the people's elbow, and Road Dog's doing the shimmy shake gimmick, and Scotty's doing the worm. I'm going to jab the guy three times, and I'm walking through it while I'm telling him this. And I said, I'm going to dance like James Brown. And I did the dance and did the splits and popped up. And then I closed on. said, then I'm going to close on. And dead serious, without getting the pop, he leans back in the corner and he goes, bro. <laughs> I need to do that every match. <laughs> I thought he was ribbing me. Great impersonation, he goes, man. That's yeah. great. He goes, he goes, no, no, I'm not ribbing you every match. And, man, I, I did it, and the people would pop on that. So besides Sarge, who else was down there doing any of the training? So you had Jody Hamilton was kind of the executive over it, for lack of a better way of putting it. And obviously he wasn't that capable of getting in the ring that much anymore, but man, he was, his mind was still as sharp as a tack. He was great for psychology. You had Sarge was probably the primary trainer and the head trainer. He was the guy that would get in the ring with you, man, and just go, go, go. You couldn't blow him up. And then there's a young guy by the uh, young guy. I say young guy because I'm getting so old now. He didn't seem so young at the time, but I don't know if you ever knew Mike Winter or not. Of course. Okay. Okay. So Mike Winter was there, and Mike was a great guy looking back now. You, everybody knows more than you when you're starting in the business. So you look at everybody like they're giants compared to you. But looking back in hindsight, Mike was probably a guy that was perfect for the young guys coming in because he had the most patience. He had good basic wrestling technique and good skills and good ability. And I think that he was really good for working with guys that needed that little extra care on the side that – you know, uh, Sarge may not have the patience for it. I'm thinking Mike Sanders. I don't think I'm familiar. Who, no, no, who's Mike yeah, Mike Sanders, 
Now, yeah. Mike Winter was a guy that, uh, as far as I know, man, and I'm not saying this in a disparaging way, I'm just being honest. Right. I don't know him to have ever gotten over the business or done much in the business. I think he did some some uh, some Saturday night shows for WCW at one time, but right. he had a connection with Jody. And, and because of his connection with Jody, Jody got, you know, got him a job there as a trainer and was a super nice guy. He, he was always barefooted, had a long, you know, brown mullet hair that he had up in ponytail all the time, you know, and just a clean cut, nice, super nice guy. In fact, when he got to the point that I think people realized that, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a great enough worker to be the guy that could teach you everything. He just teach you the basics. And at some point they moved him over to where he just became a ring guy, you know, and would drive the ring truck and set up the ring and things like that. I think for WCW, but super nice guy. And then you had pistol Pez Watley was there oh, as wow, another one of the nice. trainers that could actually get in the ring with you. So, yeah. And I would say Pez was a good polished guy. Pez had a really good eye for talent and had a really good eye for walking by and seeing you doing something and telling you a better way to do it. You're not necessarily doing it wrong, right. but here's a better way of doing it. Right. Yeah, Pez taught me how to throw a drop kick and land on my feet. You know, that's the kind of guy that, that Pez was. Yeah. Wow. Cause Pez used to do that. Yeah. Wow. Was, was Paul Wendorf there when you were there? Paul came a little bit later and Paul was in, in the company and he was more of a booker at the time when I was there at the power plant. And then as Jody started transitioning out and getting ready to retire, and they also simultaneously was thinking of moving the power plant because the old power plant was just an industrial part of Atlanta. I want to think up around Smyrna or someplace like that, you know, and then when WCW as business exploded, they built a big headquarters, you know, that I think it was only lasted about a year and a half or two years before WCW was out of business. Business, but they built this huge headquarters and then they moved the power plant over there to kind of a state of the art facility. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the power plant was certainly not near as sophisticated as what the performance center is now, but that was what it was meant to be for WCW. I mean, it was birthed out of guys like Jody Hamilton and Ole Anderson and these guys, even before Eric came in sitting around and saying to themselves, okay, the territories are dead. So we can't go there for young talent in any, it's not like we're going to be able to draw guys from WWF very effectively because they're pretty happy up there making good money. So where else are you going to go and get new talent? So they were trying to figure out a way to kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, find a triple A ball club, you know, type of establishment to groom some new young guys. 